You welcome to another exciting and educative episode of AAU Talks brought to you by the Association of African Universities and this is AAU TV. Today we are going to discuss enhancing health communications in Africa and I'm here with an expert from WAGBIC. My name is Isabella Tita Hinakwa. I'm the sitting host for this episode. We'll go for a quick break when we come back. I'll introduce our guest to you. Please stay tuned. You welcome back from the break. This is still AAU Talks on AAU TV and it is brought to you by the Association of African Universities. As I said earlier, today we are going to discuss enhancing health communications in Africa. And I have here with me um, the communication manager of um, West African Center for Cell Biology of Infectious Pathogens, WACBIP, at the University of Ghana. Before we start, can you briefly introduce yourself? My name is Andrew, as you rightly said. And uh, I'm an ed educationist. Okay. Uh, and then a communications professional by training. Okay. And I also um, am a trained conflict security and peace expert. Right. Now, you are the communication manager at WACBIP. Tell us a bit about WACBIP. What do WACBIP do? So, um, WACBIP is um, one of the um, World Bank's. Mm. African Centers of, of Excellence in Higher Education um, in Africa, of course. There are, there are in total um, about 53 of them spread all over Africa, and mm -hmm. WAGBIP happens to be one of them. And so the center was established in uh, the year 2014 um, and nested within the Department of Biochemistry, Cell, and Molecular biology of the University of Ghana with a mandate to um, carry out research mm -hmm. in the areas of, um, you know, tropical African diseases and then trying to find solutions okay. to um, um, tackling these diseases okay. as well as um, building human resource capaci capacities through the training of MPhil and mm -hmm. PhD students mm -hmm. in biochemistry cell and molecular biology right so after the the research are done what are some of the communication strategies put in place to disseminate your information i mean the research uh, findings that are being um, developed right so um what what babe does um or what 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 we do with the outcome of uh, the research that we do over mm. there is that uh, normally we try to um, develop a product mm. a product that has been shaped and informed by the outcomes of the research. Mm -hmm. And so like we normally say, um, what WAGBIP does differently is that beyond the research, we try to um, come out with these products that will be of uh, benefit, that will solve a problem in society. And so okay. um, in the wisdom of the, 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 those who were behind the creation of um, the center, mm -hmm. They thought it wise to um, establish a communications and public engagement unit. Yeah. And, and that's the unit I had. Mm -hmm. And so our main role as communicators there, and for that matter, health communicators, mm -hmm. is to, um, in one way or the other, bridge that gap between the, social, the scientific world and, and then the, the, social, okay. the social world. Yeah. Okay, so... Essentially, what we do is to help the scientists communicate what they do in their labs mm. and, and also to um, help the ordinary person in the social world appreciate the work that the scientists do and, and, and also how beneficial the outcomes of the research mm. could be to them. Right. So you asked about strategy. Strategy-wise, I would... Um, give you a few examples um mm -hmm. we had a a few of our phd students who decided to um you know investigate the genetic causes of 
hearing loss or hearing impairment mm. in, 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 in Africa or in Ghana. And they came out with very interesting findings. Um, and then they also came out with results that pointed to how pronounced the, the genetic factors behind deafness okay. uh, within the Ghanaian population mm. uh, was. And so it didn't end there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the unit went ahead to uh, engage some of these communities to find out from them whether they were even aware that deafness or that condition, apart from um, a few of the cases that are environmentally caused, mm. were indeed genetic. Oh. And most of them did not... They didn't believe they it. They didn't believe it. Okay. okay. And so we were able to put together um, a public engagement toolkit, mm. uh, one being a docudrama um, to educate people on, on genetics in general and also the genetics behind um, hearing loss. Mm. And how do we do this or how did we do this? We involved the members of those communities exactly. themselves. We involved uh, the members of the deaf communities. Exactly. Okay, so it was more or less like a co-created, mm. uh, a co-created, uh, uh, you know, product. Yeah. That they themselves were also part of um, cre its creation. And yeah. of course, when you are able to co-create uh, activities, um, products, then you, you are more involved. likely to have people um, use that product. And right. that is exactly what we were able to do with that. Right. And also um, in that same vein, we developed a, a hearing impairment resource pack. You know, the research brought out a lot of information that a lot of people did not or were not aware of. Mm. So for example, what are the signs, the early signs of deafness in children? What must parents look out for, right? We were able to unearth most of these um, um, signs and also where to, 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 to um, seek early help. And also um, as part of the, the work, uh, we've developed policy briefs Mm -hmm. policy briefs to the government to consider incorporating genetic screening as part of um, antenatal uh, care right, for, right, for pregnant mothers. Right. So this is how we translate the outcomes of research into useful uh, beneficial right. uh, services to people. So if I get you right, your main strategy is collaborations. Exactly. Right. right. So after you made mention that you develop policies for government and also I believe after your research, you also uh, come up with preventive measure, measures where you uh, disseminate to the public. Now, how do you assess the outcomes of your after like disseminating your information? How do you assess that? OK, did, what we wanted to achieve has been achieved. The people are actually putting these preventive measures into actions. How do you assess those outcomes? During the COVID-19 pandemic, for example, mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of disinformation, misinformation yeah, out there. Yeah. And every, everybody said what, you know, he, he slept and dreamt up, uh, you know, about in terms of what he believed the virus is or was. Okay. And eventually when um, a vaccine was discovered, we were hit with another uh, you know, challenge, the challenge of vaccine hesitancy, where people did not, people were adamant to, to take the vaccine for, for all manner of, you know, reasons, mm. okay, mostly which were, which could not be, um, which were unfounded, right? So we, we, we uh, engage in uh, what I would say, planned um, public engagement activities where we went into the communities and engage the publics about um, the, you know, about the virus and also about how safe the, 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 the vaccine that had been developed was or is and how it was going to be effective here in Ghana because we had a track record of consistently 
tracking the virus mm -hmm. in Ghana. So mm -hmm. you would sleep and wake up and hear that a case of Delta has been detected. Mm -hmm. That was the work uh, the scientists were doing. And what, what did it mean to the ordinary person? It meant nothing to them. But then when you explain to them that not until you are able to, through the genomic sequencing that the scientists and, and so on do, and our ability to say that today we have detected Omicron or we have detected uh, uh, Delta or the Alpha variant of the virus. And for a very long time, you are, you, you know, you are not detecting other variants, but these variants, which means that um, um, you can make a pronouncement with a certain level of certainty that at least the variants that are within the system mm. uh, are no longer further mutating. Mm. And for which reason you can then get a vaccine, uh, you know, a vaccine if, uh, what do you call it? You are not able to track how the virus mutates. mutates it's going to be difficult yeah. to get a vaccine. Yeah. And that is what we were able to do. And that is how come we were able to... Um, convince people that the vaccine was going to be safe. Okay. And of course, how did we determine that people giving the numbers should? Right. After that, that uh, education went, people, went were, going out there. people the were going out for the vaccine. Right. And, and, and I think that um, okay. the, the buy-in, we got the needed buy-in. Right. Now you made mention of misinformation, which is a big challenge to health communications. But we'll go for a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk about some challenges you've been facing. Right. Please stay tuned, we'll go for a quick break. When we come back, we'll talk about the challenges of health communications. You're welcome back from the break. This is still AAU Talks on AAU TV. If you just tune in today, we are discussing enhancing health communications in Africa. You can follow this discussion on our social media handles at Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube. And with me here is Mr. Andrew from Wagbik. Sorry. Now, as I said before going for the break, we are come to talk about um, the challenges uh, health communicators actually face. You made mention of misinformation. And even with that, I remember World Bank terming, bringing out the term infodemics, right? Now, aside that, what other challenges have you been facing in terms of disseminating health information to the public? You know, <clears throat> the concept of uh, health communication mostly is hinged on the concept of um, behavioral change communication. You know, you want, you want to change people's behaviors. I mean, behaviors that people have lived with for so many years. So many years, sir. Okay, so people, for example, may buy into the belief that no, um, there's no way a certain virus they, they, they know nothing about can kill them, right? You know, the virus was not made for them and, you know, African gems are not harmful and so on. Mm. These are belief systems <laughs> people have lived with. Yeah. And your role as a, 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 a health, health communicator, communicator is to help, I mean, is to um, let these people unlearn those wrong belief systems mm. or wrong notions. And it comes with a, a certain uh, level of pushback. Oh, okay. Initially, people are going to, you know, push back because, no, <laughs> since when did you discover this? And... I mean, who are who are you to even tell us that yeah. we need to you know change from, change from yeah. this kind of behavioral patterns? But you see, it must be consistent. Mm. When it must be consistent, and you you that you need to um, uh, kind of establish establish uh, certain systems mm. uh, to to prove otherwise. Okay, that perhaps. If people adapted certain healthy lifestyles, these were going to be the benefits. If people lived this way, these were going to be the benefits. And there are a lot of key studies. You know, one one needs to use a lot of key studies to 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 uh, nail home their point. Mm. And, and but of course, um, when people hold on to their long 
held uh, assumptions and you know it's, it's usually yeah. challenging trying to yeah. uh, uh, but then of course you need you need uh, some level of scientific proof mm -hmm. something that is palpable something that is uh, believable seeable yeah and i yeah. think that science does that mm -hmm. uh, you know in in another way science could also be interpreted to mean health and 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 so you need to have that um, evidence that to evidence show to, to, to show to get the needed change right. yeah now, as, as a health communicator, how do you, working at WAGBIP, how do you intend to position WAGBIP beyond Western Africa? Okay, so, well, I, I think WAGBIP is already beyond West Africa because, um, like, as a, a training institution, we have, if you look at the, our training pipeline um, over the past couple of years, almost 10 years since its establishment, uh, well, we has trained in excess of 400 um, masters and PhD students coming mm. from all over Africa, wow. not only Ghanaians. Okay. Okay. We have students coming from Namibia, South Africa, um, the DRC, Cameroon, and, and, and most of the West African countries. So um, I think that uh, regionally and at the continent level, we are beginning to make our presence or our presence um, can be felt. Um, uh, in terms of uh, our reach, we've, we've within a very short time um, collaborated with mm. astute uh, global health institutions um, and, and research centers. Mm. So I, I must say that we are even beginning to um, go beyond the boundaries of Africa to even form bigger and wider partnerships um, with, with, with most of these institutions. Um, yeah, so I think that... Uh, so far, we are doing well, and our impact is being felt, actually. Okay. Um, I normally <laughs> uh, uh, tell my friends, and I, I do so proudly because um, we cannot underestimate the work that our scientists do, that during the pandemic, all the, 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 the monthly updates we're getting about the pandemic from the presidency were actually put together by our scientists. So the famous fellow Ghanaian speeches that mm, you were hearing mm. were the works from the from, center. Wow, yeah. wow, interesting. Now, talking about partnership, let's um, let's come to the maiden edition of um, Wanida Symposium. I know Wanida is also a kind of institution under ACE. Now, how is WAGBIP collaborating or supporting this symposium? Uh, thank you for that um, important question. So, um, I started by explaining that WAGBIP was one of the African centers of excellence in higher yeah, education yeah. with a specific mandate to conduct research mm -hmm. in the area of, uh, uh, you know, uh, coming out with solutions to combat tropical African diseases yeah. as well as infectious yeah. diseases, yeah. right? Now, and I also said that there are about, in total, there are about, um, if I'm not mistaken, in a little over 50 mm. of such cases scattered all over Africa. Now, each of them have thematic areas that they operate within. Okay. So we have some of the ACs that operate within the area of climate change. Mm -hmm. We have some of the ACs that operate within the area of environmental sustainability or, if you like, environmental health. Mm. Some of the ACs work within the area of um, agriculture uh, production and, let's say, tackling issues of food security. Now, WAGBIP and a few cohorts of such, uh, some of these ACs, operate within the space of combating infectious diseases within uh, Africa yeah. or within West Africa. Mm. And so WANIDA stands for West African Network. So WANIDA is a network of all the ACs oh, okay. that are dealing with infectious diseases, dealing with infectious, oh, okay. uh, 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 you know, infectious um, diseases mm -hmm. within the, 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 the sub-region. So mm. WANIDA is an, is an acronym or an abbreviation for West African Network of Infectious Disease ACEs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that is, and you talk about the relationship, so that is it. So we, we as WAGBIP, see Wanida as, let's say, our mother. Okay. We are one of Wanida's children oh, okay. or one of Wanida's oh, okay. kids. Okay. Okay. And I should say we are <laughs> probably Wanida's firstborn because <laughs> the mother lives in our home, mm, yeah. <laughs> right? Hi, hi. So Wanida is uh, nested within WAGBIP. Hi at the University of Ghana campus. So that is the level of uh, collaboration that collaboration, we have with, right. with them. Interesting. And, 
and just to add, I know your next question was going to be about the symposium. Yeah, exactly. Yes. That's so, the stakeholders we should be expecting. Exactly. So um, tomorrow, God willing, um, on the 8th of March, Wanida will be hosting the first ever is maiden um symposium which which will bring together all these um wanida aces that i talked about um i think some most of them have already arrived mm. they are they are in their various um places of residence mm. and they will all converge at um Wagbip, the conference hall of Wagbip, university of ghana for the opening ceremony um in terms of who is coming mm -hmm. or the stakeholders that are participating uh, i cannot exactly say who is coming or who is not coming but those that i know the few that i know are the the ace partners who actually manage the wanida network okay. they are in town okay. um led by uh, mr gregoire zero mm -hmm. and then we what i also know is that the the president of the association of african universities will be there the 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 we have we i know the the director general of the ghana health service will, will be in attendance and of course um the managers of the university of ghana will also be in attendance so it's going to be a huge and a massive uh, uh, pro program which will afford a platform for students from the various wanida um, network aces to uh, pitch some of the research works that mm. they, they've, they've been carry, carrying out over the years to um, the, the stakeholders that will be present. Interesting. Now, we are about to end our discussion for today. But before that, um, you know, health communication is a very, very important sector when we talk about health management. So what are your last words to our audience? There are some people who does not really believe health communicators. When they come out to say this, they'll be like, no, I don't believe this. So what would be your last word to these people? And also, how can they access information? Maybe what, babe, is your internet or, I mean, your webpage free to access for more information by the public? So first of all, um, by way of my last words, I would say that um, um, health communication, and for that matter, every communication, um, uh, intervention is a planned activity mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. um, the aim is to change a certain behavior, behavior from 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 bad to good or from negative to positive mm -hmm. uh, it comes with its own challenges but um, I, I want to believe that we we are making inroads and like I said without without scientific facts it's difficult to achieve that um, objective yeah. and so once the information is credible. Once the information you are pushing out is credible and, and is verifiable, people are very much um, going to accept that information and mm -hmm. going to put it to good use. Right. Then... Uh, Whether your web page or oh, yes. information... So, so WagBip, WagBip and, and all the other ACs mm -hmm. um, are very, um, um, for the lack of a better word, very visible on all social media platforms. Right. YouTube, we have a very active and lively website, workbabe.org, and it's always regularly updated. You can, I mean, we, we have, um, for example, we have uh, these uh, dashboards, COVID-19 dashboards and malaria dashboards that have been integrated. And right. then you actually see real time um, changes when there are changes mm -hmm. in cases. Mm -hmm. Um, like I said, updated. the scientists over there don't sleep. Mm -hmm. And so we keep updating right. these um, um, dashboards on the website. Right. right. Thank you very much, Mr. Andrew. Thank you for having me. Please bring us to the end of today's discussion where we discuss enhancing health communications on AAE TV. My name is Isabella Tata Hinakwa. I am the sitting host for today's discussion. Mm -hmm.